Here we go, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and I'm calling this teaching, Getting Caught Up, the Rapture. Please follow along as I read. And John, the beloved disciple, writes in Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 1, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet, speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much uh, for this afternoon, and I thank you for my dear brothers and sisters, and I pray, Father, that... uh, By your Holy Spirit, you would speak to our hearts and you would reveal the truth that's in your word, truth that changes us, Lord, from the inside out. We love you. We look forward to you bringing the word to life. And we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody says, amen. Okay. Um, This week, I just began to think of all the expressions we use, which could include the word heaven. And I was surprised at the list I came up with. Here we go. Things like heaven on earth and heaven only knows. And if something is great, we call it heavenly. How about this one? I don't know if you've any, any of you have said this, but heavens to Betsy. How about this one? For heaven's sake or heaven sent. And, of course, this relates to my particular situation. We have a marriage made in heaven. How about this one? Almost heaven. Or that stinks to high heaven. Or heaven help us. Thank heaven I found you. You're a gift from heaven. Where in heaven's name have you been? How about this one? I feel like I've died and gone to heaven. Heaven on earth, and this is my favorite one, and wait a second, I have to say it with the right voice inflection. Ready? Heavens to Murgatroyd. And uh, I think that that's uh, Snagglepuss, but you'll have to Google that and find out for sure. At any rate, none of these expressions we may use could ever approach the beauty or the grandeur or the overwhelming glory of heaven. Heaven is the living hope of every believer. It is the place that we long for and will come to fully experience. It is God's throne room and our home, our real home. It is, as the word declares, the place of our true citizenship. Now, I must state, that heaven is not everyone's ultimate home. It is the exclusive home of those who have placed faith in Jesus Christ. So really, in this teaching, I'm speaking to believers. So let's start out by me telling us that there are two possible ways to get to heaven for the believer. Number one, by death. Or number two, by rapture. This understanding is represented to us in Revelation chapter 4 in a very unique way. You see, this chapter we transition away from the things of the church and Christ operating in the midst of the church and on to the church being called up into heaven. In our last study with Jesus' letter to the church of Laodicea, we saw a closed door, remember? Jesus standing outside and knocking and saying, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Today, we see an open door, a doorway into heaven and into the very throne room of God. Here's what I see. I see this. If we will open the door of our hearts to Christ, he will open the door of heaven to us. Isn't that awesome? Chapters 4 and 5, where we are today, or begin today, are the introduction to the 
time of great tribulation, and of course, the introduction to heaven, the tribulation period is going to be something that the earth will has never seen, nor will ever see again. It is the culmination of human history. It is a time of world upheaval, politically, economically, culturally, militarily, technologically, in every way. Kind of sounds like our day today, doesn't it? And it is God's way of calling for humanity to turn towards him. And I believe that many will. The tribulation period, I think, will be one of the greatest times of testing and one of the greatest times of revival that the world has ever faced. I know that as we look around and see so many things daily changing, yet the big events of this book are still to come. They are future events. Believe it. What we are seeing now in our world today are only birth pains of what is yet to come. So today starts the uh, third section of the book of Revelation for us. Significant is that the church is not mentioned from Revelation chapter 4 through Revelation chapter 19. Interesting also that 19 times in the first three chapters the church is referred to. However, starting in chapter 4, there's no mention of the church until the very end of Revelation. We begin with Jesus in the midst of his church, and Jesus is with us every time. He loves to hang out with believers. And so it's just really amazing that of all that we've seen, of Jesus in the center of the church, of Jesus speaking to the church, of Jesus directing and correcting the church, all of a sudden in chapter 4 it starts, it stops. So, interesting. So, let's look again at verses 1 and 2, see if we can figure out what happens to the church. And as we take this journey together, can I ask something? Please, pay close attention, because when you get to heaven, I don't I want you to be familiar with the lay of the land. I don't want any of us looking like tourists when we get to heaven. I want the folks in heaven to greet us and to say, boy, those CCL taught people really know their Bibles. Let me read these first two verses again. I'm sure I'll read it a couple more times for us. But there's a significant phrase I want us to pay attention to. Verse 1 begins, after these things, that's important. I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice I heard was like a trumpet. A trumpet's loud, a trumpet's clear, a trumpet's undeniable, a trumpet says something, gives a message. Anyway, I heard, uh, which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Interesting. Immediately, I was in the Spirit. It appears to me that John got caught up into heaven. Whether he was there or whether it was a vision that he had, um, it says, Immediately, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne sat in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Our first big clue here uh, is to the place where we are at in the scheme of things is the first three words after these things. And then at the end of verse 1, after this. You see, that phrase in the Greek is metatauta, which spelled out, it is spelled out in three different divisions of this book. And we'll come back to that metatauta, but let let me just review the divisions of this book. And that's found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Take a look at that if you want. John is instructed, write the things which you have seen, that's one, and the things which are, that's two, and three, the things that will take place after this. That's the same Greek word, metatauta. So section one of the book of Revelation is the things, John, which you have seen. Well, what has John seen? In chapter one, he saw Jesus Christ in heaven. 
a vision of the risen, glorified Savior, sovereign over all, Lord of lords, King of kings. In section two, the things which are. That's chapters two and three. We just finished that. Seven letters to seven churches. It's the church age. And then section three, starting in chapter four, going forward, future events, the things which will take place after this, metatauta again, after the things of the church. Verse one again, let me read it. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first verse, the first voice I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Who is that first voice that John hears speaking to him from heaven and inviting him up and in through the open door? It is the same voice that invites you and me into our heavenly home. It is the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, sovereign King of Kings, Come up here, he says. That should give Christians a thrill to hear that. The voice, like a trumpet, the same voice of Jesus heard in Revelation chapter 1. And we also read about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Let me read that to us now. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now it's important for me to mention that what's being spoken about here in First Thessalonians chapter 4 is not the second coming of the Lord. And the Bible's clear about that. You see, when he returns, he first returns to catch the church away. And that is going to be a big surprise to everyone. Whereas his second coming as Lord over all and judge over all, in that case, Every eye shall see him. It won't be a surprise. Here he comes. So what we are seeing here is the rapture, the catching away of the church. So let's talk rapture for a bit. And I've got four points here, four main points. So the first of them leads me to ask this question, possibly you too, if you're unfamiliar with the rapture especially. So first of all, what is the rapture? So here it is. The rapture is when Jesus Christ comes to remove the church, that's all believers in Christ, from the earth. This will include resurrected bodies for the departed and transformed bodies for those believers at that time. In that instant, we will be changed and united together with Christ and forevermore will be with him. The rapture described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which I just read, uh, is also referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. Here's what it says. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, and sleep is a term for Christians that have died, Christians that have departed, Christians that have gone on ahead of us, that have passed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You see, the Lord himself will call us up in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. And I know you might find this funny, but I went to see if I can look up with how much time it takes for an eye to twinkle. And uh, I guess somebody has timed it. So uh, an eye can twinkle in one ten thousandth of a second. 
it is here's the point that he's going to come to take away take us away from planet earth to the meet with him in the clouds it's going to happen in an instant in the twinkling of an eye he's going to tuck us away safely from the wrath of god poured out on a christ rejecting world trust me for the tribulation you will not want to be on the field but you will want to be up in the skybox there's my little baseball terminology because we're in the World Series time right now. By the way, Dodgers are going to win. I'm predicting that. <laughs> we'll see how good my predictions hold up. Don't trust my predictions. Trust the predictions of the Word of God. Now, interestingly, the Greek word for caught up is not the word rapture. It is the word harpazo for caught up. And its meaning is to seize to carry off by force, to claim for oneself eagerly, to snatch out or away. That's harpazo. It is used several times in the New Testament, 13 times to be exact. So where does the word rapture come in? The word rapture is taken from a Latin translation of the Bible. Now, this is just me. may mean absolutely nothing. Why did we center on the word rapture and not on the word harpazo? Let me ask you a question. Would you rather be raptured or would you rather be harpazoed? <laughs> I think that people gravitated to that word rapture. It's just beautiful. Our, oh, by the way, our word heaven, uh, the English word heaven comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word, which means to be uplifted. <laughs> Doesn't that fit? Heaven uplifted. Are you ready for Jesus to uplift you and catch you up to himself? You may not have thought of this particular verse as a rapture verse before, but Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 3, he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's coming back for us. Every single word. You see, Jesus not only tells the truth, he is the truth. And using another baseball expression, so far Jesus is batting a thousand. <laughs> Every time he says something, it comes true. So if he says he's coming back for us, if he says he's coming back for you who believe, then guess what? He's coming back. How wonderfully, hopefully thrilling is that? Which leads us to another thought. Point number two, why is there a rapture? Why have a rapture at all? Now, among the many things to bear in mind, and a lot of these things I think as we move through the book of Revelation will become more and more clear to us, but let me just start out by saying, because there is a rapture, and Jesus promised a rapture, and the Bible teaches a rapture, it sure helps us to keep our eyes on Jesus, doesn't it? It helps us to keep living right. I mean, if you knew that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment, that should have an effect on how we live. Keeping us from God's judgment is part of the rapture, and also to comfort us. I'll get into that in a moment. When Paul the Apostle penned the words, we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, he was responding to concerns raised by the church family in Thessalonica. Uh, you see, they had written to Paul concerning loved ones who had died in faith while waiting for the rapture, and the church has been waiting for the rapture every church age we wait for the rap we're waiting for the rapture right now and we don't know when that's going to come um we know a few people that have died in faith waiting for the rapture don't we and those believers in that church when who had written to paul asking him this question they wondered had those who've gone on before so they missed out and what's to become of them so Paul says to them in 1 Thessalonians, starting in verse 13, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have 
fallen asleep, gone on ahead. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Christ. You know what that tells me? That tells me, believer, that we are so covered by God because we know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We're not going to miss out on anything. Uh, We're not going to miss out on Jesus. So whether we are coming with him or going to him, guess what? God has us covered, coming and going. Now, I know that some folks um, may come to such studies with an attitude like, well, why do we even need to study end times? Um, Why do we have to go for teachings on the rapture? Well, here's why. Uh, We just read it. The Bible teaches us, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed. You see, we are not to stay continual babies in Christ. That's, I'm putting it straight, straight to us. No, contrary to that, we are to know Christ and to understand both what is going on now and what is shortly coming up. Very shortly, in my estimation, and the current condition of the world. Understanding these facts will have an immediate effect on how we live. Knowing that Christ would catch us up at any moment encourages us to be ready and brings us comfort that this world is, by no stretch of the imagination, our final resting place. No, guess what? You have reserved seating believers in heaven, and it's just waiting for you. Keep in mind the great promise you have from this book. This is the book in the Bible that makes a promise to you and makes a promise to me. It's in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. It reads, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. You're promised a blessing for the study and application to your life of this book. And let me add, in order to highlight our great, hopefully growing interest in these chapters, So let me ask, do you have a loved one in Christ who has gone on before you? I know practically all of us do. You know what? Prominent in my mind is the recent recent passing of my dear son Christopher that I love so much. Also prominent in my mind is my father, and there are other relatives and friends, folks from this church who have gone on before us, people that I want to see so much and to greet them with great big hugs. You know, there's an old hymn with the words, what a day, what a glorious day that will be. And it is chapter four that we get to find what they are seeing, and what they are experiencing. And that's of great interest to me. What's going on with them right now? Because there are times when I say to the Lord, Lord, say hi to my son for me, and then I'll see him soon. Say hi to my dad and the others that have gone on before us. The rapture tells us that instantly at any moment we will be reunited with them in the presence of our Savior and Lord. We are to live every day with this amazing living hope. Martin Luther, writing about heaven, said, I would not give one moment of heaven for all the joy and riches of the world, even if it lasted for thousands and thousands of years. C.S. Lewis wrote, Joy is the serious business of heaven. And how about Peter, that burly fisherman? He wrote that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Here's another thought worthy of our consideration, point three. Is the rapture shown anywhere else in the Bible? Well, I think that Peter had a bit of a catching away, don't you think? All of a sudden, he was in the Spirit and in heaven, and he talks about what he sees. How about Paul the Apostle? And Paul the Apostle at one point, uh, well, he was stoned to death, and he said, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but I was there in heaven. And he said, the things I saw, the things I saw, I, I, there are no words. I, I just can't tell you it was that great. Jesus speaking of the rapture in Matthew 24, 40 through 42, says this. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. And how about John, the beloved disciple? 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, he writes, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him, Jesus, as he is. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. See how it affects our life, knowing that Jesus could pluck us out of the world at any moment? And this may lead you to wonder, if anybody else has been caught up into heaven, well, let's start with Enoch, shall we? You guys familiar with Enoch in the book of Genesis? Who walked with God and was not, for the Lord took him. Enoch was caught up, raptured by the Lord into heaven. What, what a walk that that man must have had with God. And the ancient rabbis tell the story like this. They said that one day Enoch and God were out for a walk and walked much further than they usually did. And God said to him, Enoch, we are closer to my house than yours. Why don't you just come home with me? (laughs) Isn't that great? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Oh, that's our goal, that we have that same testimony as Enoch, that we walk faithfully with God, and that when Jesus comes to catch us up, we're ready. And talk about being caught up into heaven. How about the prophet Elijah? 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. It happened as they continued on their walk and it's talking about Elijah and Elisha, that suddenly, I like that word, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. That's a rapture. Now, I want us to consider, I've already mentioned John himself, and I've already mentioned Paul the Apostle, but... Can I give you another rapture to consider? How about this? You may not have thought it, but the best one for this is Jesus Christ himself. Acts chapter 1. The resurrected Jesus, after he had given the boys instructions to go and preach the gospel, he says in Acts 1.9, well, not he says, but here's what happened. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched... He was taken up, harpazo, taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. That's what we have to look forward to. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who said, Man of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This 
same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. I got another one for you. I hope you're ready for this. How about Philip, who was sharing the gospel with an Ethiopian man? This is in the book of Acts. Do you remember this? Sharing the gospel. Um, and when he was done, Acts 8.39, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. That's it right there. The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Azotus and passed through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now, I know you're going to say to me, Paul, uh, that is not raptured into heaven. And, and I agree with you, but how about this? Philip was raptured sideways, not up, but sideways. It, it's an example of being caught up and translated by the Spirit of God from one place to another. Same word harpazo is used here. Let me ask, can God move you anywhere he wants? <laughs> Absolutely. And this leads us to the all-important million-dollar question, pretty much my last point of the day. And it is one that I will answer for us today. It is that all so burning question that so many people have tried to answer and sell their books and whatnot. But here it is, point number four, when will the rapture take place? You ready? Here it comes. Answer, I don't know. As a matter of fact, no one else does either. And you might say, well, how can you say that with such certainty? And for that, I will quote the sure words of Jesus, who said in Matthew 24, 36, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So when somebody predicts the rapture of the church, they don't know what they're talking about. Even if an angel from heaven came down and said, I'm telling you where the rapture is, and an angel writes a book and says, here's when the rapture is going to take place. And they pick these dates, September whatever, November whatever, during this particular feast day. Guess what? They don't know what they're talking about. The best we can say is this, to always be ready. And how about this? We could say this too. This sure looks like the times in which Jesus would rapture us out. Or this looks like the very season that it could happen. But other than that, that's about as far as we can go. It could just happen at any moment. How about that? At any instant. And Lord, we're waiting. Now would be a good time. Look at verse 2. I'm going to end here. Immediately I was in the Spirit. Sounds like he was caught away. I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. This begins our introduction into heaven. I please want you to read ahead and get ready. It is so exciting. It should give chills to the believer. And this is where we hold up for today. You know, years ago, we used to sing a song. Some of you may remember it. Heaven is a wonderful place, filled with his glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. So read ahead and be blessed. And let's take in the heavenly view. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today. And I thank you for my brothers and sisters. And I thank you, Lord God, that you have planned purpose and meaning for each of our lives. Holy Spirit, teach us, lead us, guide us in this all-important time of history that you have set us in. Use us for your glory. Help us to walk with you in a pleasing manner. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you so freely give us your grace, that you're willing to forgive us by faith in Jesus Christ who took our place on the cross. 
Lord Jesus, forgive us of our sins. That's all you need to say. Forgive us of our sins. I turn from my old life. I now choose, decide, want to serve you. I want you to be my Lord, to be my God, and to be my Savior, and I'll follow you all the days of my life. I return back to you the love that you so freely now give to me. I pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody says, 